name of the game today is to convert this crusty old wood cutting miter saw into a cold cut saw. First things first, we've got to mount the blade properly, so I can take this cover off. Now, there are actually a lot of reasons why you want a cold cut saw. Traditionally, I cut metal with a abrasive cutting wheel on an angle grinder. It is very fast and works quite efficiently. However, there are a few problems. Uh, namely, it makes uh, a large amount of dust. It also has the unfortunate habit of making some burrs on the metal. And lastly, of course, the grinder is a hand-operated tool, meaning any cut I make, whether it's on a sharpie line or whatever, is never going to be as good as something that actually has a fence on it and angle measurements and whatnot, like this compound miter saw here, which will actually allow me to cut on angles and make precise straight cuts. And that's the main reason why I'm doing this. Now, the strange thing about this fastener is it's actually righty-loosey, lefty-tighty, which is the opposite of how it should be. And that's to make sure that the motor torque doesn't undo the fastener. I'll just pull that off. And you will see that this is a 5 8 bore, and the actual red part of the saw here is a 1 inch bore. So what I did was I took a washer that was, had a 1 inch outer diameter, I pressed it in, and I drilled out a 5 8 hole. So, take our blade here, make sure it's going the right direction, and just slide it on there. Works good. Take the same piece here, pop that over. Lefty tighty, ready loosey. And I'm doing this while the saw, uh, I'm doing all this while the saw is unplugged, mind you, of course. Let's give that a little tighten, doesn't have to be crazy. And fumble to get the guard back on. Once that's roughly lined up, start grabbing some fasteners. So that's our metal blade on our wood cutting saw and now we contend with our motor RPM. Now you might say, why not just throw it on a dimmer switch? Well, I can actually show you what happens when I do that. This here is a standard lighting dimmer switch, absolutely not meant for this application, uh, but it operates in the same manner as pretty much every other dimmer switch. Crank it up to max. Still works effectively, the problem comes when I try and slow it down. Uh, to get it to actually spin slow enough, I need to really turn it down and at that point it either stops working entirely or it does what you just saw, where the saw starts randomly inputting large amounts of torque and kicking around. Uh, so a triac is not going to do the job. Okay, just in case you're wondering a bit about the science of why the dimmer doesn't work and the transformer will. Um, what we have here coming out of the wall is a basic sinusoidal soidal uh, waveform. It's a sine wave, so what it does is it goes up to positive 170 volts or so, then it dips through 0 volts, and then goes to negative 170 volts. Uh, the reason why we call it 120 volts is um, it has to do with the root mean square. Um, basically what it's saying is, is if we apply this wave to a resistive load, uh, we will get the same power output as if we were using 120 volts DC. 
but essentially uh, that's what the waveform looks like. When we use a dimmer, uh, we are using a device called a triac, and essentially uh, we're splitting up the waveform. So instead of having it rise up, we don't supply any power during the initial rise of the waveform, and then we wait to the right moment and we suddenly turn it on, and we get this huge current spike, and then it carries through until it hits the zero crossing point where there is zero volts. Um, because the triac cannot turn off until it reaches this point. So to control how much power we're getting out of the dimmer, we're essentially just moving the point at which we turn it on earlier in the wave or later. Um, and that's, as, that's how dimmers work. Now the motor doesn't like this for whatever reason. I'm assuming it has something to do with the messy chopped up waveform. Uh, which is why we're going to use a transformer instead. So the transformer, all it does is it simply takes this uh, AC waveform and it just reduces the amplitude. So we still have this smooth AC waveform, it just peaks at a um, lower value. The first step in dealing with the transformer was to remove the secondary windings. I chose an angle grinder for this purpose, but I had to be very careful not to damage the primary windings. If the primary coil is cut, the transformer is pretty much garbage. After I had one side of the secondary coil cut, I removed the remainder of the coil with a chisel. Finishing this process, I was left with a transformer coil with room for my own custom windings. So to figure out what we need to do with our transformer, uh, we have to do a little bit of math. In this case, I'm targeting 2100 RPMs for my 10 inch metal cutting saw blade. Taking the saw's original RPM of 4800 at 120 volts AC, we see we get approximately 40 RPM uh, per volt AC. And if I take the new RPM and divide it by that figure, I can find the voltage I need, which will be 52 and a half volts. And I have a transformer equation here which is basically saying that the voltage of the primary over the turns of the primary will equal the voltage of the secondary over the turns of the secondary, which essentially means there's a, a set ratio between uh, voltage and number of turns. Uh, doing a little bit of rearranging, we see that the number of turns we want on the secondary is equivalent to our new target voltage times the primary turns over the primary voltage. Uh, finishing that up, you see we need about 40 turns. And that's assuming everything is linear, which I think it pretty much will be, but we'll have to see. All right, here's the fun part. So I measured it and I'll probably need about uh, 40 odd feet of wire to do this. So I've got this huge pile of wire on the ground. And at the same time, it might be a little bit hard to fit all this into the transformer. So while I'm doing this, it's gotta uh, be tight the whole time. I gotta keep it as tight as I can. So that means uh, bending it real tight around this core here to minimize the used space. And then I gotta pull through all the wire 40 times. And once we're there, same deal, bend it tight around the core, as tight as possible. Bend it tight. That's one turn right there. So now I gotta pull through all this wire. I think you guys get the picture of the process. It's just a series of feeding it through until you get to the end. Transformer here, line that up. Okay. 
Okay. Knockout's now in there, now secure. Next up, I'll feed each of these wires through. So for this outlet, it's kind of a unique setup because the transformer produces an isolated, ungrounded output. Uh, so for reasons, I'm going to effectively ground that output. So now our outlet is essentially going to be grounded, or at least we're grounding out uh, our supply so it's no longer isolated. And I'll strip these and get these set up. Alright, so here's the setup. Um, this transformer essentially uh, creates a new and separate uh, AC supply which isn't actually directly connected whatsoever uh, to the traditional AC input. So I got it coming into this outlet here. And normally the grounds and neutrals are tied together back at the uh, central fuse box or breaker panel. However, in this case, I'm essentially creating a new AC supply right here. So I have to tie them together here instead. So we've got our AC coming out of the transformer and our neutral is tied to the ground. And then we essentially now have a hot wire here. And then this ground is gonna come out and it's going to get grounded to the main iron core of the transformer uh, which will then be grounded back to the main AC supply. So this whole setup is going to create our 52 volts AC and it's going to be connected to the same ground as the rest of the electrical system. So probably should be using an extension cord with this and not uh, permanent install house wiring but uh, Keep in mind that I uh, don't have any of that stuff lying around and this is not a frequently used item so it shouldn't be a problem wear wise. Okay, so now we're grounded out. I need to get some spade connectors on here. Remember not to touch it when it's on. And we slide that onto there and Slide that onto there. Yeah, normally this is how the secondary coil would have been hooked up. It's grounded to the iron core of the microwave transformer. And then it, you have the hot wire coming out. And that's how it's actually set up. This is how it's traditionally set up. So nothing's changing really. I'm just changing the amount of turns in the coil. Uh, everything else in here is ready to install. Of course, you're not meant to put solid core wire into here, so I had to put on ring terminals. Normally you don't do that, but whatever. Okay, well, that's on there. Not the prettiest thing in the world, but it'll do. Okay, that's in there. this set up here and it does indeed output our 52.5 volts so let's test it out so first thing that happens when I plug it in is it starts vibrating and making that noise and now this is a microwave transformer designed for intermittent use so it wastes a lot of power when it's not doing anything I actually tested this and if you leave it on indefinitely it will reach a hundred and five degrees centigrade or so so it is not something that's meant to be plugged in all the time uh, but for a short 
periods of use, it'll do fine. Take the saw here, plug this in. Just flip this little guard up here. And I'll use my digital tachometer. So the saw is now rotating at 2600 RPM, which is 500 RPM faster than the linear calculation said it would. Uh, so evidently the saw motor doesn't behave quite linearly, so it may be a wise idea uh, to check it as you're winding the transformer to make sure you don't add more turns than you need. Uh, in this case, I'm going to have to go back and remove a few turns, but in the end it will actually end up working. Alrighty, so I went and I pulled some windings out and just recrimped it with the right amount of turns. It actually took more than I thought, but in any case, let's plug this in and see how well it works. So we are pretty much right at 2100 RPM, uh, so we'll go for a test. Just for comparison, I will try and make a straight cut with an angle grinder. So here's a comparison of the two cuts. This is the saw cut here. This is the angle grinder cut. This entire section of the tube is too hot to hold. Whereas when I pull it off the cold cut saw, the cold cut tube is just warm to the touch. So almost no heat, almost no sparks. Absolutely loads of sparks. And some reasonably large burrs as well. Whereas this produces um, pretty much none at all. I do find that on the saw it's kind of hard uh, to use it because uh, cold cut saws require a very light amount of pressure, whereas it is almost impossible for me to push down without moving this blade like in a jittery motion. If I try and move it very slowly and smoothly it's extremely difficult. So the saw ends up taking the occasional um, deep cut and then smooth and then deep. And that's kind of probably hard to see, but if you get the right uh, angle there, there's a pattern and then there's these occasional score marks and that's from the saw suddenly going like that, basically. Um, otherwise, it does produce some very uh, overall clean cuts for sure. And also as for straightness, I did pretty, pretty decent considering. Um, but it's still not possible to make an entirely flat cut uh, by hand with an angle grinder. And that's the main reason why I wanted to move to the saw. The angle grinder is quicker, but it's um, not a very refined experience. Well, gentlemen, I would say this has been quite a successful end to my experiment. Uh, if you enjoyed this content, I would implore you to uh, like, subscribe, and perhaps check out some of the other videos on my channel, which you might also like. Um, thanks for watching. See you next time.